Good afternoon and uh, good evening, everyone who joined our JetBrains Academy online meetup. It's a special event uh, bridging gap between design and development, uh, which tackles a very hot and I would say challenging topic. So i glad that I see the YouTube uh, channel. I see that we are live. I'm glad that more people are joining us. Please welcome. Uh, I think it's time to start. So uh, first of all, a short introduction about what's going to happen in the next three hours. So we have six speakers. They are all here, all on the line. And uh, we have six talks in our agenda, giving three different views from their product design and development perspectives. As the first speaker in the lineup, I will cover the product view uh, and explain how uh, the overall software development lifecycle is uh, established and how to build uh, the team, the efficient cross-functional team that share the common language uh, across uh, the different domains. Right after that, we've got the design section with uh, Nikita starting uh, his talk with a design and handoff process. Nikita, say hi to our audience. Hi, everybody. How are you? I'm, I'm good. Thanks for joining. And uh, right after that, Yekaterina from the JetBrains team will share the design system challenges and the way how they tackled the building design system and aligning design and code. Yekaterina, are you with us? Yeah, yeah, hey. Hi, nice to see you. After that, the third module contains three different views from the JetBrains teams. So we will start with the web team and Andre, front-end developer, will share his view, how they built the design system. Andre, are you online? Yeah, hi, guys. Nice to see you. And uh, Valentina will continue with a view of the desktop team and the way how IDE team builds their beautiful product and the, the challenges they are facing. Valentina, you are here? Yes. Hi, everyone. Nice. Nice to see you. At the end, we've got the special guest, Roman, and the special view from the data analytics point of view. So he's a software engineer and will share how the, the same principles could be applied for the data analytics domain. Roman, are you with us? Yes, hi. And yeah, they are together with the Yekaterina, so I'm glad that you are in one room. So, guys, we, we've got YouTube channel, and I see any comments that will appear right after each talk. We've got some time, and we can ask our speakers the best ones, so I will... Uh, I will pick the best ones, and uh, if you think that this question is relevant to the talk, we can address them right after that. But at the end, we've got a round table with uh, all six speakers, and we will discuss uh, different views on the most uh, challenging topics and questions, uh, and everything will be around the, the process, design to development process. So I encourage you to participate in the chat, leave your comments. I hope that you will enjoy it. Uh, and I think that we are ready to start. So as I said, the first talk will be from myself. And, uh, um, and the idea is to explain to you how to organize design to development process for complex digital products where you've got multiple product teams and they should work all together. I'm Matvey, I'm a head of product and art director, founder of Graphica and Product Map and some other startups. So hopefully you will enjoy it. So we we right in time, so let's let's kick off. First of all, design to development process in a nutshell contains different steps of the software development life cycle. And the idea in a nutshell is to align different areas like design, code, analytics, and product with the same common language. So the cross-functional product team has many 
functions and everybody should work shoulder to shoulder with each other and uh, achieve the better results because at the end you should have the working product in production. Uh, and everybody knows that the process uh, of launching new product or uh, launching product updates to production takes some time. We start with a user research, analytics, design. After that, we implement it, we launch, we iterate. But if we align all different functions of the product team across the same design language, we can ship our product to production faster and achieve the better results if everybody who is on board share the same design culture and understand what product we are building, then we can shorten time to market and uh, the final business objectives will be achieved much quicker. But uh, there are different ways how product-driven companies organize their uh, cross-functional teams. So as an example, here we've got different squads and each squad has a product owner. Uh, they've got a simple responsibility to ship their product and everything combines all together in a bigger product. But with a growing team, uh, you see that you've got different chapters, different functions, and they should be synchronized between different products. So this metric structure allows you to synchronize different products and different functions across the whole company. But everybody knows more teams and people involved, more inconsistency you will get at the end. And that's why we should understand how to work all together. So as a common design toolkit, uh, three pillars of the efficient product helps you to maximize your product metabolism, which is the most important metrics. How often do we ship new product to the market? And three pillars allows you to do that. It, definitely, it's an it's a activity which is relevant for the big companies and uh, enterprises. But on the company level, even if you are very small, you should align uh, different functions. First of all, how you can do that, you can start a regular synchronization between design and development teams, organize design handoff process. That's what we will cover later in the next talks. Organize knowledge sharing and present as much as you can, share information across the whole company. So that's very important. The second pillar is more than tools and solutions. Uh, the collaborative tools, it's a modern reality, how you see it everywhere. The best tool where you can bring the whole team and uh, collaborate, that's the right modern tool to select. And uh, we provide, we create many artifacts to share knowledge between different functions. Automated specification creation, it's one of the critical parameters that helps you to speed up process and uh, improve uh, the handoff between teams. And uh, everybody knows that if you're building the digital product, the, uh, the availability of the user interface uh, elements and components, uh, which is version controlled, obviously, is very important to build your products faster. Uh, building new screens from the off-the-shelf components. But last but not at least, uh, it's people and communication. If we've got bigger, bigger team, bigger company, we need to start sharing the right principles and sh share the right culture between different departments. And all teams should be aligned with the right product goals and objectives in order to maximize the team potential. Sometimes you need to find process leads and drivers, uh, and there are different ways how you can do that, including design ops department, in order to enable teams with the right design culture and the right uh, artifacts. Plus, uh, cross-functional units allows you to share experience between them, and uh, this process should be also organized. So, uh, if you're working in the product, you know that many different departments should work with each other and uh, all of them use, should use the same design principles, starting from the marketing, content management, 
branding PR, moving to the product grow, product design, UI, UX, and development, and QA, everything until the data analytics and product analytics, including customer support and sales, the whole end-to-end -end process from the beginning until the end should have the same, uh, the same objectives and the same language. So we as a company, as a product team, need to build a common language in order to enable products with the right tools and uh, solutions and principles that will help them to achieve business goals. That's, that's the main objectives for everything what we are doing. And starting from the beginning, the right way how you can do it is to move incrementally. So we all want to have working products and uh, we can implement the right design culture using atomic design principles in a simple steps. So the first step and the first maturity level is to align company on the branding. And the key elements here, typography, colors, grids, and layouts, and any graphics, including illustrations, icons, and so on. Right after that, if you've got the overall branding and the company aligned on that, you can move forward and uh, implement the basic UI kit, including design tokens, colors that you're using for user interface, plus components and any data visualization elements like charts. Using this simple UI kit, you can extend it and move to the next level. So usually it's called design system that contains much more than just a simple UI kit. It has UX foundations, navigation, interaction principles, plus some guidance how to use and implement adaptive design. But right after that, if you've got the design system across your digital products and many functions using that, you're starting to implement the high level design language across the whole company, which includes uh, content design, templates, and the way how we assemble pages, screens from them, plus some high level patterns that include some principles and guidelines how to use the design language across the company. So how to build products online and fast and how to start doing that. So it's a top to bottom and bottom to top approach. So you need to start from simple, small steps. And after that, you will extend your maturity levels, adding more and more elements. So the first step is to align different teams across the key branding elements. So branding is, is a key part of that. The second step is to define the atomic UI components. And the third step is to align your design and code and start implementing complex UI components, which always a high level components. They contain atomic components and you can build high level components easily. But when you've got them, you see that you've got some principles, you integrate these components into product and you're starting to build some templates from one page to another. You see templates, you see patterns. And the, five, the fifth step is to create the language that glues everything all together and design patterns that are shared across different screens and pages. So, and that's a feedback cycle. Right after that, you will start improving everything from the beginning, it's starting from branding, atomic UI components, complex UI components, and so on. At the end, you will have the big library of the off-the-shelf solutions that everybody can use. Designers, marketers, developers, product owners, they will start using that uh, design language and validate hypothesis quicker. So that's 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 the end goal. So ideally, we should start incrementally. We should start small. I suggest to start with the first step, which is an alignment uh, on the components library and language, how we call them, how they work, and uh, how the overall library looks like. So which, which components do we need? One of the great examples, it's a components gallery, which includes different standard components across different design systems and companies. And uh, that's a language that we can use as a first 
uh, version, but everybody will have their own because uh, the requirements of each company are different. And the second thing that you need to do after, as soon as you specify the helicopter view and overall picture, is to build your own process, how you manage changes and how you add new components into the library. Ideally, you should come up with a checklist that design operations team and uh, the, any other team, product teams, will use when uh, the new component or uh, any change is released. And there is no process that works like a silver bullet. So everybody should develop their own. But we need to focus on the process, how we build these elements and how we expand the knowledge across the company, how we sign off these components and release them to production. One of the important part, the important elements of the right communication between different departments is speaking the same language and everybody understand the final code, the final product, it's the language of the working solution. So different company functions and domains should understand how it works and the JetBrains Academy offers this simple uh, courses that allows you to learn these languages quick. And if you're a designer, if you're marketing, you can start learning uh, code, writing ID. And from my point of view, it's the best way how you can start uh, on practice. That's the best way. So in general, uh, if we want to sum it up, uh, there are different lessons learned, what we've seen from the experience of launching uh, big and complex digital products. The first thing, we should align different small product teams that are aimed to deliver a specific functionality or specific part of the product. And we should align them across the design language. So they should use the same language when uh, they think about the product they are doing. And uh, building the right process, building the design system uh, requires leaders that will lead this activity, that will share knowledge, engage multiple product teams with a contribution, and uh, keep the consistency uh, across the whole company. So that's the second thing that we need to take into account. Implementing changes, it's a hard process. And if product is already established, our speakers will show you more examples from the real uh, teams and products that it's, it's not the easy process. Everybody understands that it's possible to do that, but it takes some time and efforts. But what is important is to receive feedback and improve the process step by step in order to keep, keep an eye on, uh, on the way how it was implemented. And uh, this culture of continuous knowledge sharing and improvement helps to organize the right process between design and developers. And the only one thing uh, how you can do that is to be radically open, transparent, and share information openly between different product teams and uh, departments. But everybody understand that it's a it's a hard process and it, it costs some time and efforts. Um, but if you start from the beginning, uh, then you will reduce costs when you, your company starts scaling. Uh, and uh, if you've got a broad product line, including web, mobile, Android, iOS, and desktop pr products in the portfolio, that's a must have approach. So there is no option not to implement that. And that's why we've got speakers from different teams to share uh, experience with you. So I've made an introduction. And uh, if you've got any questions, I see so many uh, hellos from Berlin, Nigeria. Guys, thanks for being with us. And uh, yeah, the, I, I think we will move forward with the next presentation. So Nikita. Are you, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. So I will do some magic. And now 
your slides are online. So I'm passing word to you. Yep. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to the meetup. I'm Nikita Vysotsky. I'm product designer at Pelon, small Swiss startup. And today I'm going to tell you about the tricks of design handoff processes. So this presentation is maybe a bit more for designers than for developers, but I'm sure developers also can find something interesting for them. And also I will try to share, share some tips and tricks about the handoff. So I think it would be useful for everybody. And let's start with short introduction about feature development process. So here I listed some of the steps of the development process, including research, design tests, development, review, and launch. But in general, we can split it into two main parts, which is design and development. And this arrow in between actually means the handoff, the handoff process. The thing which translates the design into real UI and UX, which is experienced by users. And this handoff in between is actually not really simple and clear because handoff is not only Figma file. It is not only few PNGs, images in Zeppelin or something. It is actually much more, including project document, task description, handoff meeting, etc. And let's try to go deep into the details and start with the project document. And here I want to share some uh, example from my past experience. If you had something like this, if you have web experience, something similar, please share your experience in uh, chat. It would be nice to read it and explore your thoughts. So let's assume you made a design for example a few sprints ago and somebody for example developer comes to you and ask hey actually why you did this or why this was like this and not like that and when i was younger and less experienced designer sometimes i'm struggling to find an answer because okay it was two weeks ago and yeah why did i do this um and it was real problem before I started using project document. So what is it exactly? Project document helps you to find answer. How does it work? Why did you make this decision? What was the alternatives? And where is the documentation? And here on the right, you can see the example of my project document for one of my latest projects. Yeah, as you can see, lots of text. But in general, it's quite easy to write it because it is like the story of decision making of your designs. Um, what should be in the project document? So again, it is my example and let's quickly go through it. The first part is actually the context, the problem of the project and the goal. And in this goal section, maybe one of the most important part is the out of scope. Here you describe which is not a part of this project, uh, the part which is not in your focus. So you can be more focused on exact scope. The second part uh, is user stories, and it's a very useful thing because by defining user stories, you also define the way of what you want to, uh, to design and test. So for example, uh, on this stage, if you design three uh, user stories, that means that you will have at least three prototypes, three uh, workflows uh, in your design. Also, you can use these user stories for testing, for user testing, and also for development processes. Then one more important part is discussions. And in discussions, you can uh, define your decision making. So for example, why did you choose the option one rather than option two? why option one is better and what was the pitfalls. And the last and maybe biggest part here is proposed solution where you explain everything you, dis you decide, all the design, all the solutions and so on. 
In this template, I also have much more sections, but yeah, the content is actually depends on what you need on your product and on your team. So we have a little bit more section, but you can adjust it by yourself. Uh, of course, it's not only written by a designer. It is collaborative work of product manager, developer, of tech lead, and by you as a designer. So it's collaborative work and you need to work together. And again, the uh, contribution depends on your processes and on your team. Let's take a look at the references. And maybe the first reference that comes to mind is the Google Design Doc. It uh, focuses mostly on technical design rather than visual design, but the structure is still good. It can be a good reference for your documentation. Also, it is nice to take a look at the project brief and intercom, which uh, is focused a bit more on the uh, requirements and doesn't contain any solution. They have it in another document. And also based on the job stories rather than user stories. Again, you can adjust it by your processes and workflows. And the last example I have here is Figma design brief. They have a nice article about how to write and create the design brief. And also they have a template for FigJam, which you can use in your workflow. And let's finalize this uh, chapter with some tips for project document. And maybe the most useful tips is that adjust it for yourself. Uh, speak with all your co-workers, like uh, project manager, product manager, developers, what you want to include in this project document. And use whatever you need. Uh, select any tool. For example, I use Notion. I used to use uh, Python Wiki, and so I know someone who uses Google Doc. Uh, everything is OK. Let's move to the next chapter, to the design system. And actually, design system uh, is not 100% connected to the handoff, but it makes it much smoother and nicer. And let's start again with some example from my past experience. Again, uh, comment, add comments if you experience something like that. So for example, I made my perfect design and I asked developer use this nice big brick button with this black 100 color for text. And then eventually, apparently, I received the answer, hold on, what is this button? We have only, for example, primary and secondary button. And what is exactly black 100? We don't have these colors. And is it a color? And all this because I didn't have a proper design system and mostly important, it wasn't synchronized with the development part. Because the design system allow you to speak with your developers on the same language. And actually, you don't even need to speak because all your designs will speak by you. And developers can find easily everything they need from your designs. And so the design system will be a connection between designer and developer. Um, regarding the handoff process, it means that you don't need to have this unnecessary conversation about changes in components, about any new styles that you implemented, and all these things. And you can focus only on user problems and on the solution. Some examples uh, from reality. So for example, here we can see how the usage of uh, variables, tokens, component variants, uh, yeah, help, can it, how can it help uh, developers to work with the design? So they can easily see any variable, any variant, and it will be as easy as just copy and paste properties into the code. Let's jump to the next section, and it will be about Figma mockups. And let's start with another example, focus it on the file organization. So again, when I was less experienced and didn't have a nice file organization, sometimes when somebody asked me for a design for some uh, task, it was quite hard to find it. 
even if you think that you know where is it, eventually it comes to some findings like, oh, actually it was in a draft file or I put prototype in another file and so on and so on. And for the smooth experience of the handoff, uh, it is nice to have a well-organized project structure so everybody from your team, like developers, again, product managers, can easily find all they need through the uh, your designs. And other quick tips, yeah, maybe the main tip is just try to duplicate everything from your task tracker, use task uh, names and task numbers in your design, in your file names, in your project names, and try to add links everywhere. So for example, add links for your design file to the task and vice versa, add link to the task to your designer, to your designs. Uh, structure that I use, as I said, uh, I tried to duplicate a uh, task tracker structure. So for example, product team is the team in Figma, project is the project in Figma and task uh, is a file in Figma. Regarding file template, I would say that you should have file template because you must have it because it is standardized the design delivery and each developer will know what it, what to expect. They know where they can find the designs for them, where there is a page that I, that they don't need to see, and yeah, it makes all the process simpler and smoother. And again, some tips for this. So. Yes, try to separate pages uh, like like page for developers, page for testing, and page for playground. Use the same uh, file structure for every task, and you try to use this new Figma ready for the feature, which is really nice for developers. Uh, again, example from uh, my experience. Uh, so I use this file template in the top. Uh, we have some pages regarding the project context, then the main important part for the developers, which is like ready for dev uh, mockups, then some part uh, regarding testing, user testing, part about the design review, which is uh, which contains mockups, uh, which can be reviewed by designers or developers also. And the last part is the playground where uh, you as a designer can do everything you need. So let's talk now about the handoff page or this ready for the page. What should be included in here? And of course, I would say you should start with user stories and user flows plus prototypes. So again, this user stories came from the project document and each user story means at least one prototype in your ready for the file. Then it is important to highlight errors, empty states, content, overflow, and other examples. Um, it is very nice to have this in template because, for example, I sometimes forget to uh, add error states for some screens. And if you have it in templates, it is really easy to recall that you need to do it. One more thing is special states. So it stays depending on, for example, user roles, user types, uh, like, like onboarding or some uh, different states of the screens. And actually I have much more section in my template, but again, it depends on your workflow, on your product, and you can adjust it by yourself. Let's take a look at my example. And as I said, I have the user flow on the top based on user stories. Then in this template, I use special states. And here I also list the user types, for example, role on different organization level. Then section for errors and validation, section for large content where I can describe the way of scrolling, way of truncation and ellipses. Uh, some empty states and also adaptive and we have some templates for emails again if you don't use emails it's you can adjust it as you need and some tips for the file structure the obvious one is 
use section to structure the page. I know some junior designers doesn't use it, but yeah, use it. And name your frames um, as clear as possible. Now Figma has this search feature and it's nice time to name your frames properly so developers, designers can easily find it. And speak with your developers and try to find out what is important for them to include in this hand of page. What do you usually miss in your designs and add it to the template? That's actually how I build my template. And let's jump to the hand of meeting, the essential part of the hand of process. And first question, do you have hand of meeting? If you don't have, I would highly recommend it to have. Of course, you don't need uh, to set up a meeting for every small changes, but if you're working on the big project, it is very nice to have this meeting because like nice and smooth hand of meeting actually means that your design is done. Only after that, you can say that you complete the design and your design is ready to development. Let's again take a look at some experience from my past. Uh, from my past. So let's assume it's meeting uh, Thursday 10 a.m. and I invited uh, all stakeholders and asked them, what do you think about project document? Do you have any questions? And receive apparently the answer that, oh, what project document? And that means that I should be prepared and prepare everything beforehand of meeting. I should share everything before, not just 10 minutes before. I should share the project document, my designs, everything, at least, I don't know, a few days uh, before the meeting. So, so everybody, every stakeholder can check it, can read it, can ask questions, and you can prepare the answers. And for example, consider different options for different questions. One trick, uh, it is nice to save versions in Figma version history before the handoff, because during handoff, maybe some changes are needed and it is nice to save version before handoff. So you can compare, for example, on the next, on the handoff to meeting, uh, compare changes and choose the best option. And you can use this Figma compare changes feature to do it. Yeah, in general, um, sometimes one meeting is not enough. And after, like for example, first meeting, you can have some comments and changes is needed. And using this, you can easily align everything on the next meeting and, for example, um, do it smoothly and align everything just in two meetings. And let's jump to the last part, uh, which is communication. Of course, sometimes we argue about our co-workers. For example, as a designer, I can think that developers always ruin my designs, always do my design like, like I didn't design it. And as a developer, I always can think like the designers tries to redesign everything, tries to, I don't know, create new components every time. But actually, it means that you have some problems. You have some problems in processes. You have some problems in communication. And just try to solve problems together. Just collaborate. Try to find the best solution for you as a designer and for you as a developer and for our users also. And just speak. Speak with each other. Try to understand your opponent, try to understand the developer if you're a designer, try to understand the designer if you're a developer. Try to listen to each other, try to understand problems of each other and try to help each other. It is absolutely okay if you need to add some designs, try to understand why this design can work in the development, try to understand why designers create new components and just help each other. It's the main thing of the each collaboration, each uh, design developer process and work. And some communication tips. Uh, first of all, as a designer, try to get basic knowledge of HTML and CSS. It helps you to speak with the developer on the same language and understand their problems. On the other hand, try to teach uh, your developers 
about design. Try to set up a meeting, a workshop, for example, about Figma, how to use Figma, or uh, some give some lectures about the design basics. And if you don't have any regular meetings with your developers, I would rather recommend you to have one because it is really cool to be a friend with your developer, to speak uh, and to collaborate. It can be just a retrospective about, for example, last project. Also, it can be talk about the design system and so on. And let's jump to the conclusion and some lessons that we learned. So first of all, design outcome is not just mockups. It's also uh, documentation and communication. I would recommend you to use templates as much as possible. It makes your design standardized and align processes with the handoff. And of course, communicate and be friend with your developers because you are in the same boat. You do the one things you need to work with each other and it's the most important part in each work, I think. And thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Hello, miss me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> unfortunately, we turned off uh, all questions at the beginning of our stream. And uh, I highly recommend to reload page for everybody. So now questions are enabled, chat is working. I've got a few questions to you, Nikita. Okay. So you said that ideally we should spend some time on the handoff documentation. And for sure, it's some extra time that you need to spend. But how much time you will spend if you don't have it So in comparison on the with the time you spent on the documentation. So what, what is the approximate ratio from your experience? Okay, it's hard to evaluate, but uh, there are definitely some problems because first of all, uh, you always forget your decisions and you always cool. uh, like redo your things. So for example, you uh, did it in design once, you then you, for example, have the same uh, question in the next design and you again forget it and did it for example in the wrong way and it's not the same way and it, like make your design inconsistent between each other for sure and uh, yeah and also through the development it's kind of the same developers comes come back to you and you try to recall what was the decision why you did it and it's just make everything messy so it's again it's hard to relate how much time uh, you are saving, but it definitely makes your uh, product better and more consistent using the project document. True, you you're absolutely right. And you mentioned that you manage uh, the kind of documentation out of the Figma. So, what tools are you using to to do that? Is it Notion, as you showed? Yeah, yeah. I so uh, you can use Figma, but Figma. So, for example, if you want to share your design, your project document with some stakeholders which are not using Figma, it's uh, better to have some common tool. And I use Notion, which is mm -hmm. kind of our wiki for everything. So it's available for every stakeholder in our company. Yeah, I agree with you. And it's very important to have a collaborative tool where people can leave some comments, where they can openly discuss uh, user stories and some issues with the design. So I think it's a must have for the tool to be collaborative, right? True. Okay. So hi, everybody who is joining us from different countries. I see, I see some comments in the chat. So leave your uh, questions to our speakers and right after the talk, we can address them. So now Nikita, thanks a lot for such inspirational talk and uh, hopefully somebody will get some uh, lessons learned from from your talk now i will do some magic and we are moving forward with uh, yekaterina who is ux designer at the jet brains so uh yekaterina stage is yours yeah hi there um, I'm Kate and I'm UX designer at JetBrains and currently work, work as a product designer in the Cardano project. And today I want to talk with you about 
problems which we are faced with during using our design system. Uh, uh, we at JetBrains have several design systems for different types of products, such as landing pages, websites, uh, web services, and IDs. And in our project in Kadana, we use Ring UI, which is perfectly fits us uh, because it's suitable for interfaces with a bunch of charts, tables, uh, high density information, and so on. And um, uh, our design system, like approach to using our design system is pretty common. We have a Figma file with a bunch of elements, like atomic elements and well, bigger components. And also we have a storybook with developed uh, React components. And uh, the approach is like the same as in, in other design systems. We design new components in Figma and developers implement this uh, components in the storybook or change the styles of the old components. And the library is pretty old. It's about eight years. And uh, during this time, it was evolving and changed a lot. Uh, it started, it was started as a sketch file with a limited amount of components. But now it is a huge Figma file with a bunch of components and different states and variants. Um, when we started designing Kadana, we decided to use many custom components. Uh, it was several years ago, and uh, at that time, Ring UI wasn't updated to its last version with the clean and modern design, and we wanted to be uh, different from, from our competitors in terms of UI. So we implemented a lot of custom things. And, but then when Ring UI was updated, we decided to switch to Ring UI completely. And uh, sounds pretty nice, like switching to the company's UI library with pre-built components. And uh, it might seem that uh, always would be predictable and seamless and uh, consistent, and there will be no miscommunication between designers and developers. Uh, in ideal world, maybe, but in, not in our case, uh, because during uh, this transition and even after that, we faced several problems and we still experience some problems and trying to fix them. Uh, let me call these problems pitfalls. So let's start from the first pitfall is uh, inconsistency between Figma file and the storybook. Uh, it, sometimes it happens that we have a bit different components in the Figma file and in the storybook. And uh, sometimes uh, developers come to us, designers, and ask why this dialogue has different, a bit different margins, or what font should they use? But we have different versions of font in the storybook and the Figma, but what should they choose? And uh, this question is, like, uh, they have to investigate and uh, spend some time to decide, should I implement the uh, a bit different component from Figma and create a new component? Or should I use a component from the storybook and ignore these minor changes? And it takes time. It's not, it's unclear. So not a good approach. For example, in this case, a developer came to me and uh, tell me that he noticed different uh, margins from the content to the buttons. buttons. And uh, some time ago, before that fact, uh, we decided to change the styles a bit in the library and change this exact uh, space. And uh, it was updated in the Figma file, but uh, it wasn't updated in the storybook because, of course, this developing task takes some time. And developers are always busy, and it's not the huge capacity of this library designers and developers team. So uh, the task was uh, spawned, and the developer didn't know what to do in this in this case. Um, to fix somehow these problems, what we have done so far is, first of all, 
uh, we uh, scheduled regular meeting and thanks to the library design team they scheduled that, that meeting uh, where we uh, once in a couple of weeks discuss uh, what we are going to implement to the library, what we are going to change. We share our ideas or complaints because sometimes components uh, don't work good enough. And uh, this process became definitely more transparent. And uh, the second thing, which is really awesome, uh, the library designer organized the Kanban board where he placed all current and planned task, tasks and now it's really easy to track the progress and to understand the current state of the library. And for example, in this case, I mentioned before with this dialogue, developer might just check this board and understand that, uh -huh, this dialogue is like going to be changed in a couple of weeks or even in progress. And uh, he will, he won't spend this extra time to investigate this difference. And uh, what be nice to have is to sync our Figma file and Storybook somehow. And there are uh, Figma plugin for such kind of synchronization and there are any other tools uh, dedicated for this, this purpose, but we haven't tried yet them. But I think we will try. Uh, the second pitfall is uh, inconsistency due to custom components. And sometimes uh, it happens that we need to develop custom components. For example, in this case, we uh, needed to add these notifications as like banners uh, to the Kadana UI, but we didn't have any types of banners in our library. So, and the, the task was pretty urgent. So the only possible solution was just to develop custom banners and just to release this feature. And uh, sounds pretty nice because we we are like there are several products using this library. It's it it and it's hardly impossible uh, having absolutely the same UI for these different products uh, because every product has unique features and sometimes it needs uh, custom components. But uh, the pitfall here is that support of these custom components is a bit different and it's a bit harder because uh, it's um, uh, they won't be updated when the library will. So we have to keep in mind that uh -huh, these banners are customized, so we have to change it separately and so on. Um, what uh, we have done to somehow fix this problem is again uh, communication and as I mentioned before this meeting regular meeting where we discuss new components and uh, we uh, propose these components and ask every product team which uh, using ring UI library uh, we ask this question like would you use this component or maybe you even think about uh, implementing this component in the nearest future. And uh, it might turn out that uh, many teams want this component. So it, then we discuss the details, uh, UI styles and so on and implement it. And I think it's pretty smart approach and it helps us. And it, it's currently helping us, but it definitely will help us more in the future to get rid of this uh, local custom components and to enrich the whole library with new components. Um, what would be nice to have here is uh, the task prioritization because it's hard to understand, for example, if we need a component right now, or we are going to release the feature in a, like, I don't know, in a month. It's hard to understand how quickly we can develop this component and we have to uh, be in a hurry discussing the styles, implementing these elements and to the storybook. So sometimes it's easier just to make temporary solution and then replace with, with a library component. But again, here just we, here we have just discussed more and prioritize and uh, 
uh, set deadlines and so on. The next pitfall is about uh, custom style supporting. Sometimes we need to customize styles uh, of the elements from the library. Uh, for example, in this case, um, we in Kadana decided to change uh, the custom or the default hover style uh, because it, it was pink in the UI. But Kadana interface is pretty bright and colorful, and there are a lot of charts and icons with severity, which are red, uh, red, uh, orange, yellow, green, and so on. So this pink uh, hover color would be definitely redundant. And we decided to replace it with a dark blue color. And uh, in this case, it worked perfectly fine because uh, our developers just uh, changed uh, the variable, it just redefined it, and uh, all these changes were applied to the whole project. And uh, I think that is a smartest approach. But uh, not all the components have these variables in the library. Sometimes developers have to uh, add additional uh, classes to the components and to redefine this class, like to, and assign new styles for these classes. It also works fine, but it's inconsistent. Somewhere it's variables, somewhere it's classes, and there are no certainty in this uh, question. And more than that, sometimes it might happen. We uh, didn't check whole library, and uh, it's hard to say for a whole library, but sometimes it might be that it's impossible to assign a new class to the nested element. So it might be really hard to change the styles in a uh, correct way. And uh, what would be nice here uh, to have, I think, is a uh, universal approach to the style changing. And uh, the fourth pitfall is a lack of some component states. And sometimes it's we're faced with this problem that some components don't have um, enough variables, enough uh, states in Figma file. For example, uh, some time ago, I need to design this drop-down list with the option at the end of this list, with the action at the end. Uh, and uh, this uh, drop-down list with the action is exist in our storybook. So it's really easy for developer just to take this component and uh, implement it in our UI. But in Figma, we didn't have uh, such option for this component. We had only list options with checkboxes, without checkboxes, uh, with uh, some hint text, and that's it. And what, uh, what I did, I used this component from the library, and I had to detach it from the library and make it as a custom component, and uh, then design uh, absence part of this. UI. And it sounds easy, but since I did that, this component became isolated from the library and it uh, won't be updated in my design when the library will be updated. So it's really not a healthy approach. And uh, to fix this problem, uh, what we, we have done, uh, our uh, library owner gave an edit access for some contributors. And uh, I think it's like the uh, easiest way to get rid of this bottleneck effect because before uh, all the changes were implemented only by uh, library owner. So we discussed it together, but uh, he implemented it. But now it's possible to implement it by other contributors. Uh, but it's not an ideal approach because it's re it requires library's owner review and uh, it's not synchronized with other processes. And uh, what would be nice to try, and we even started to discuss it, is a Figma version control approach, uh, where designers can contribute to the library using their own branches and then merge uh, their branches with Figma file. And the library owner will review these changes automatically. And I hope we'll try this approach soon. 
And uh, at the end of this presentation, I want to sum up uh, these problems and tell about what we like, um, achieved, but what we got from these problems. Uh, it's obviously that communication is a must have as a, like, how to say it, a key part of this process uh, of user, of successful using the design system, the corporate library, because uh, it helped us a lot to clarify the state of the library, to save a lot of time, because now we implement really less custom components, we discuss more, we implement more, contribute more to the library. Uh, what else? It's really important to have clear agreements in terms of priorities and deadlines uh, and plans. And it should be transparent not only for contributors to the library as designers, but for developers as well. Because uh, it's really saves developers time when they try to investigate some changes, some hidden uh, features of the library. And uh, what uh, the last but not least point is don't hesitate to try something new. And uh, in our case, it is a Figma version control approach. And it seems it's like a bit hard and we have to rework whole, whole process and uh, started to control it somehow because of course, uh, it's always hard to start a new activity, like when we when you have old and working processes. But I think it should be profitable in our case, and uh, uh, we definitely have to try that. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, who's back? Uh, thanks, Kate, for sharing your experience. And we understood that it's not the easy process to implement it, right? So many challenges, but what success you and your team have enjoyed after implementing that? Can you share your positive emotions with us? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, uh, the first, I think, uh, is that uh, developers started to spend less time to implement new features, new designs, and it's uh, it became really easier to navigate uh, in the library and to understand the state of the library. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, and uh, um, also we, uh, how to say it, uh, trying to involve our developers, not the library developers, but our product developers into that communication with the library developers. So they can discuss some technical approaches, as I mentioned before, for example, with this variables or, or yep. Yep. class uh, ch changing classes for components. And it became really easier and uh, saves uh, a lot of time for us. Yeah, so everybody should be on board and united with the same goals. So, and after that, the overall team dynamics and uh, the the general motivation increases, right? Yeah, so that's that's, cool. that's the main point. We've got a few questions. They are not very linked with your presentations, but let's discuss them. So. First Let's of all, try. do you have any experience with the .NET applications? So it's not for your team and your talk, but have you tried to design something for mm -hmm. .NET applications? No, 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 I, I haven't, and I'm not an ID designer, but I tried to yeah. design uh, a couple of plugins for ID, uh, yep. but it w wasn't my main project, so no, I'm not experienced in .NET which, which design. Which have been... Yeah, which two have been using just for these designs? Uh, also Figma. For, okay. uh, you mean for uh, plugin, ID plugin yeah. designs? Yes, yeah, so yep. also Figma. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that answering the question in the in the chat regarding .NET applications, uh, the Mi Microsoft has a big Figma file which is open and it allows you to build using the standard components your applications fast. Uh, you can use different tools, but uh, the best way is just to use Figma. So I would say that it's a state-of-art tool and uh, you will achieve the best process using Figma. So I'm not sure that something else exists. 
And there is another question, and I really like that. So Mark is asking, uh, what's about accessibility? How do you test your colors? So you show, by the way, different uh, color schemes, dark one and light one. Uh, do you have any process to test these colors uh, on the contrast check or different yes. color plans? Yes, yes, we have a pre-built, not a pre-built, but uh, tools for, I, I don't remember the certain name of this tool, but there are a bunch of tools for macOS, for example. You can just uh, run it and it's like additional layer on your, uh, above your design and it can highlight like your uh, color palette in terms of different uh, blindness types. Okay. And also, we are using uh, uh, guidelines, uh, uh, AWAC, I don't remember this abbreviation for this organization. W3C, yeah, that's a common a guideline yes, yes, for they, accessibility. Yes, and there are also a bunch of online tools where you can pick uh, your colors and they will highlight the level of contrast, AAA, AA, and they have this gradation like with letters abbreviations and you can and they can highlight it like your contrast level is great your contrast level is not enough and so on so yes we check with the different tools agree with you so uh, there are many ways how you can do it so you can do it if you already developed something and you've got the code so in this uh, type of approach everything should be automated and there is a plugin for Figma which is called a contrast checker it, it basically mm -hmm. does what you described so I think uh, it's not the question about the process how to organize it it's a like to organize transition between design and development I mean it's more yeah. about process how we test our designs before even the uh, implementing them. So in in our case, we uh, tested these colors in the library, and uh, it's a pretty first step because it's uh, like pretty first atoms of the library where you decide what uh, colors uh, you should you will use, and if you prepare all the colors and check them, and then you build whole the system based on these colors, I think you won't be uh, struggled without contrast issues because you pick these colors properly. But of course, uh, there might be some combinations between background and, uh, for example, hint mm -hmm. text, and then you can check it with the different tools like in Figma plugin or online tools uh, to get rid of these uh, potential issues. Indeed. And I agree with your topic, uh, with your point that if you test these colors in the library, you will be 100% sure that it works. So if you put tested colors into your UI library, then everything is okay. So your product will be safe. So I agree with you. So that's a good point. So uh, let's move on. Kate, thanks for participating and thanks for sharing okay. your experience. We know life is hard, but uh, there is a light at the end. So we know how, how, yeah. how to do that. Thanks Thank for you. participating. And yeah, the design section is finished now. We are moving forward and Andre is joining us to share his experience about web development at JetBrains. So Andre, you online, stage is yours. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. So hello everyone going. once again. Uh, my name is Andre Muhin and I'm a front-end developer in the JetBrains AI team. Today, I want to share with you my experience of participating in two projects where teams were integrating design systems into their work. This talk will focus on the crucial role design systems play in harmonizing the effort of designers and developers. We'll explore the challenges and strategies in this uh, integration process, drawing from real-world scenarios. And also, we'll take a look how practice meets uh, with the theory. Uh, first things first, uh, before we start, we need to design uh, what design system, we need to define what design system is. Uh, so a design system is not a, uh, only a collection of UI components or sty style guides. It's a holistic set of tools and principles that guide the entire product design and development process. 
By establishing a unified language for both design and code, design systems enable consistency across the different platforms and products. They are, they are essential for maintaining visual and functional harmony, especially in complex projects of large organizations where multiple teams work on different aspects of the product. Why is these systems are so important for a development of a product? Well, just as most tools available for design and development, they help uh, teams to develop their products faster and with this less obstacles. And obviously it uh, makes business happier. Uh, so let's assume what's an ideal image describing flawless interaction between design and development. It sounds pretty simple and it can be visualized as something like this. Uh, all the parts of the process are making their own commits into the result, dispatching features one at a time, working like a looped conveyor. Sounds easier, right? In fact, no, because, well, doing hard things is pretty hard. Uh, because modern products uh, are so complicated that its development could be a quest. So let's take a, let's take a look of, uh, Let's take a look for the first case. Um, this was uh, this is a project which I'm currently participating in, and uh, by the way, uh, not so long not so long time ago, it finally left its EAP and was successfully launched. So the first case we explore is uh, in our. Uh, talk about integration of design systems uh, is a product of uh, which consists of multiple websites and uh, single page applications. Designers and uh, developers work closely uh, with the same team. The setup created a dynamic and fast paced environment. Designers were constantly producing new layouts while developers were quickly implementing these changes. This approach greatly emphasized the need for speed and adaptability in the process. The whole process was looking like design teams was creating mockups in Figma, not being worried about the way and the frequency of how designers were implementing them. Uh, time to time, we had a call for an hour or two to synchronize all the differences we had and make a list of tasks. And after that, saying goodbye to each other for a month or so. But obviously, this way of, organizi of organizing process also had its own downsides. With the time, each integration iteration of this synchronization started taking more and more steps to reduce the distance between what is being expected and what we had in reality. So our speed started to decrease. Luckily, we started facing this problem already being not so far from the release point. So we were still able to prepare the MVP and fit all deadlines. What was learned in, during this project? The chosen approach uh, gives an ability to change the products really fast, just in a few comments. Flexibility gives a possibility to launch upcoming and unexpected features without any obstacles. But because of this flexibility, there can be a rollbacks and technical faults because of the process not being grained fine uh, or because of lack of tests. Also, it's, it's a matter of fact uh, that uh, at one point, you'll definitely cross the line of no return and you have to decide uh, how to organize your design system next. This brings us to the second case. This, this was already an enterprise company with a lot of projects being in production for years that decided to teach them with one styling language. As I said, there were a dozen projects involved into this shift, so the whole list of participants would take a significant time to name, and the numbers of items was astonishing. So first of all, we started to discuss how, to, if, how it's even possible to produce such a change to this number of products and reduce the possibility of failure as much as possible. After several months being spent only for discussing, the solution was born. It turned to be a multi-step process being ruled by several teams, having a whole book of complete instructions how and when each item could be changed, technical instructions for developers, product aspects for designers and managers. There was a whole optimization mechanism reinvented from the scratch, uh, giving a possibility to each product to adjust the system to their own needs. Yes, each change took an infinity to apply, but it seems bulletproof. So the process looked kind of an ugly. But ugly doesn't always mean bad. 
it was hard, it was complicated. It took a lot of time uh, each, to make each step inside of your own project because of someone else's. But it appeared to be extremely safe and reliable. And by extremely, I mean that we had zero technical faults for the whole year I've been participating into this process. What are pros and cons of this case? An advantage is obvious an ability to stand still and make no errors if you follow all instructions and respect restrictions. But the price for the safety can be acceptable not to everyone. It takes you not only a month to prepare before the first result can be achieved, but also it could cost a while. As a conclusion for these two cases, I would like to make such points. First of all, you need to define the goal, what and why you want to achieve. Next, you have not to forget that flexibility not always means lack of communication. Feel free to organize your processes and adjust them when it's needed. And don't be afraid to experiment. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Andre, for your brilliant talk. And uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you with the launching MVP because you said that product is life. Am I right in my understanding? Yeah, yeah, it is life and well, pretty okay. successful. Yeah, that's that's great. So, and you've got a small team, quite small team, and you mentioned that you've been using your design system to launch this MVP. So, approximately, how much efforts uh, you uh, saved uh, using the design system of the shelf and all the shelf components? So, just from your experience. Oh, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, if we define, uh, uh, if we try to measure the impact which this design system brought to the time that we saved, I yeah. guess it's going to take us much longer to talk <laughs> uh, <laughs> than my presentation uh, was. But uh, actually, from my experience, I uh, also had uh, several projects before where there were no design systems or not even a design team. So every part of the product of project was uh, on the developer's responsibility. And I can definitely say that comparing the success of uh, that project and this one I'm working on currently, I can say that it's a significant difference. True, because if you're doing it from scratch, you're reinventing the wheel. If you've got all components in place, you you assemble it like a Lego. So you, you've got everything in place, and after that, you just make it live, yeah? And your MVP will be launched much, much quicker. So that's that's the point. And uh, the, the only one question, uh, one more question that I want to ask, uh, the the process between design and uh, developers you said that it was uh, hard to start this process as far as i understood but what was the main uh, problem or challenge at the beginning so why it was really hard to launch it from from scratch uh well i guess you're asking about uh, the second case where it was yes. a huge company with a lot of yes. products and participants well actually that's that is uh, the biggest problem, uh, mm -hmm. the amount of things that you need to adjust each other because all these projects were uh, in production for years and mm -hmm. they've got their own culture, their own frameworks, their own design systems already being built inside this project. And uh, at first it took a significant amount of time just to meet with every team, uh, ask what uh, do they want from uh, their upcoming design system? What uh, pain points do they have? What uh, experience do they have and how they, uh, how they can help us or even if they want to help us or whatever. So yeah, that, that's what, is, that what uh, first, I guess, month or two was about actually. True, and uh, as in the software development, you start with uh, collecting requirements. So you want to uh, share uh, experience between different teams, get their requirements and start implementing it step by step. So it takes some time to, to listen to everybody, bring everybody on board and agree on the next steps. So 
I agree with you. So I, I've seen the same uh, and uh, I, I feel your pain uh, because from my experience also the same thing. Okay, thanks, Andre, for, Thank for you. your talk. So see you later on the round table. And now uh, the stage is open for Valentina. Valentina, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. So you can start uh, with your case and story about ID team. Yeah, thank you. So Andre previously was talking about challenges in web-based application, and I will be talking about challenges in desktop application, but not like general challenges, design, of course. And I can talk about that because I'm a software developer and team lead at uh, JetBrains Academy. And I communicate a lot with developers and uh, designers. And so, yeah. But before we go, uh, let me share some information about like our team. So, uh, so you can understand a little bit more about us. So we are a plugin for IDE, uh, which means that uh, we uh, develop desktop application uh, and plugin for this. And actually it means that our plugin can have different release cycle comparing to ID. Um, it will important later, but just remember it. Uh, another thing is that we are quite new to design process because we previously worked without dedicated designer and for small task, we did it like ourselves because we thought like, okay, we are creating tools for learning programming languages and we can dog food it. We can use dog fooding to understand what is better. Don't say me it's naive. Okay. I know it. And, um, Another thing that you have to know is that everyone works on uh, UI in our team. It means that uh, we don't have a backend and front end specialization. So people have uh, different experience. And this is something that you can also be aware of. And today I will be sharing with you some uh, cases that happened uh, in the last year and a half to just uh, illustrate how we uh, understood the um, ideas that that guys were talking before. And uh, first case, it's about setting educational IDs. Now you know that before we had uh, special versions of educational IDs, and at some point, uh, like a year and a half ago, uh, our product managers understood that it's something that doesn't have product value anymore and we want to sunset them. But important for this case that uh, in these IDs, we had this My Courses entry point and this is for, and for the new users, it was like super important because this, uh, when you are a newcomer, you need a straight way how to just start learning and all this ID concept and interface can be scary. So you just, you want to go as soon as possible. And uh, we needed to like keep this experience smooth for the newcomers. And when um, product and marketing team came to me, I thought like, okay, it will be like some button somewhere on this welcome screen, maybe on this learn tab. So it will be like easy, I don't know, one week work. And so I was quite relaxed for some time. And then I went to designers saying like, okay, we need to, we need to implement this. And they came up with some very logical solutions saying like, okay, we can uh, move all the content that previously was on my courses page to the learn tab. And also, yes, create this button that just helps users start uh, learning right away. Okay, looks good. But from the coding side, it's also mean that apart from implementing new UI, we also need to create some coding interfaces in IDE repo and move logic from plugin in all these integrations um, can sound a little bit bug prone. And also we have three weeks before IDE feature freeze, which means that if something goes wrong, oh my God, my product and marketing team wouldn't be happy to hear like, oh, sorry, it, we had some integration problem and that's why we can implement this. So I came to designers one more time saying, okay, 
<laughs> can we have somehow split this designer design so I can have a backup plot? And yeah, we we did it. And in the first phase, it was like I imagined with this one button that helps you just okay start learning right away. And then on the second phase, we implement the whole design. And it looked good good enough sorry <laughs> it looked good enough uh, and it worked but uh, we spent more time with communication with each other and with um and designers spend their time to actually thinking of how they can divide this design at, and also we lived with not beautiful interface for a couple of iterations and we learned quite actually simple lessons that even if you worked without designers before, and you consider yourself a smart developer who can understand how this design things work, mm, but you have a designer already. Don't invent things yourself. Go to designer as soon as possible, especially if you have a task that several sub teams are also working on and deadlines are pretty strict. And yeah, that's what, what we learned. And now we are integrating our designers in the such discussions as soon as possible. And this was my first case. And uh, we are going to the second one, uh, which is like working with mockups. Um, in, in the first talk, Nikita uh, told a lot about um, this process and like how much documentation and other stuff actually are part of it. But I will be talking about this from a different side. So uh, let's begin. This is like the main interface of our plugin. And we understood that we want to have this thing, this navigation bar. Let me zoom in. And here it is. So this was the mockup that a developer received. And you can see, OK navigation bar with some buttons but these buttons are not in our component list this is the new components that were created especially for this uh task and also the developer responsible developer it was one of uh the first uh, their first experience with uh working with ui on our project but we actually didn't think much about that and so when after the first uh, developer iteration design looked like this and i'm as a developer i can say like yes it reminds it actually looks like on the mockups kind of right but when designer sees they, they see this difference just yeah right away and actually it took us three design review iteration three developer polishing session to make it look uh like on mockup and both design designer and developer they spend so much time on these interactions and um uh, working together and this was very like educational and but it also was very very long and so we uh, after that we learned that we need a guide for our developers and as nikita said in his pre first talk, we understood that uh, we need to talk about design, how design works, how expected results look like. And now we have uh, this lecture that was made by our designer and the um, uh, presentation with all these um, instruments and how and some tips and tricks how to work with Figma. And uh, we learned by this experience. And now I can share some uh, tools as a bonus track for you. Most likely, you won't be using them, uh, but as a, just as a fun part. So how we work as a, a desktop team on a desktop to actually compare design or in, on mockup on what we actually implemented. So uh, first, we use digital color matter um, thing and you can just find it it's uh, you can find it on your mac and it's useful to actually compare the color you you have on your desktop and with the one that you were supposed to use on figma 
Uh, the next thing is super cool, actually. It's uh, accessibility uh, zoom. Uh, you can enable it in accessibility zoom use scroll gesture, and it allows you just to like uh, scroll zoom in anywhere. And it's um, super, super useful, but I can show you in the next video. And the next thing is macOS screenshot tool. Most likely all of you use that if you use Mac, it's like same day shift four. And uh, then you just see this ruler, but uh, when you drag, it shows widths and heights, but okay, I sh uh, I'll show you, um, I'll show you the video, right? Yeah, I'm showing you the video, how it looks. Here we go. Okay. Now you're using this zoom in from accessibility. And here you can measure the distance between two buttons. I don't know why you need this distance, but you can also like the size of the button. And then you can compare it with Figma like this. So you have uh, all the like borders and stuff, and you can measure, measure if they are the same uh, on your um, desktop application. So that was that was it from my side, Al almost because I also want to summarize what we actually learned um, by these cases. First, we learned the simple thing that for conceptual product changes. We need to ask designer as soon as possible and don't try to implement or think of implementation ourselves and build any expectation and mm, of development time for this. It can be quite painful. And another thing that although uh, for some people can it can be, at least for me it was this, that developer-designer communication is something that just will be developing itself and uh, it can be this way but it this way it can be long and you better uh, learn by during this communication how you where are the problem and how to solve them and document this and this is the process uh, so that was our takeaways from these uh, cases and thank you and learn with JetBrains Academy. I like us. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's that's true. Thanks for such insightful talk and sharing your tips, how you test your uh, code and product and compare it with Figma. So cool. Uh, guys, I want to engage everybody who is watching us. Uh, feel free to ask questions to Valentina. I've got one. And uh, it's as a follow-up of the previous accessibility topic. So you showed that you've got uh, a light and dark scheme in your application. So tell us, what, how do you manage it? Uh, like, tell us a few maybe tricks behind the scenes, how it's organized in the code. Yeah. So for um, this light and dark teams, they are part of the main IDs uh, product. And uh, actually, you can create your own just... Yeah, wow. just so you know yeah but we have predefined ones and uh they are in json format and you can and when you just switch the theme in the settings uh it's actually another uh, set of colors is loaded this is the main process uh for us it's a little bit uh different because i i showed you that we have this task description panel mm -hmm. it was in the second case and actually it's a it's a browser on desktop so to change some formatting and stuff like that we use normal css normal okay json is on also normal <laughs> uh no prejudice but okay um we use css and so for us it's a different task because we also need to be um um, aligned with the ID team, uh, uh, but uh, using our CSS. Uh, so for us, it's ID team in JSON and also CSS to uh, configure our task description browser. Yeah, so, sounds cool. So am I right that you, you are able to override something or you can just reuse what ID team has? So how does it work? How, how do you align? Uh, 
different skulls. Uh, a good question. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, to be honest and soft, I say that it's a work in progress uh, okay. because, yeah, we do this. Um, actually, now we do this mostly manually, uh, and it doesn't work well in in all the situation because yeah it shouldn't be manual work and mm -hmm. we are actually now thinking how to um align and like um follow the maybe some changes in ide teams to bring it to us because now it can be yeah it, if we did don't notice something it can be different in ide and in our browser yeah it should be the common process otherwise you will have an inconsistency so that's yeah. what we're trying to avoid uh but you mentioned that one knowledge session with designers was very insightful yeah so you learned yeah. a few bits how to you i don't know develop uh better uh, i don't know interfaces and some basics of figma uh, do you plan to continue such sessions and maybe how often if you already have something in mind? Uh, I, I think for uh, for now, um, we don't have a like precise plan for the next session, but we have a document uh, which we want to present at some point when it's more ready. This document contains um, the main components that are in IDs, and we are working on creating a mapping between these components and where these components can be found in the code base. And mm -hmm. now it's like work in progress, and we encourage our developers to just participate in filling in this like um, this relationship. But uh, when it's ready, I think we will present it as a next step. But also what. I personally think we should do that we should like analyze our problems in design developer process like more carefully and if something doesn't work maybe it doesn't work not just in this exact communication but this is more as of a system problem and that means that we need to have another talk and describe uh, some other mm, things that were not clear or were not obvious so yeah that's One. the plan 100% agree with you. And just an idea from the top of my head, if such tips are very helpful for your team and developers, what do you think to publish them as a course on JetBrains Academy? So maybe it could be <laughs> available for the rest of the audience. So what do you think? Uh, I think we definitely should like gather more materials and I'm not sure if it's, uh, if the first step could be like um, publishing Oh, maybe why not? Because we can we can create this course and see exactly. if it's like useful for our uh, colleagues for like the whole company because now it's only in our team and then we can just uh, share tips for everyone when they're. Why not? Uh, if you got useful, materials, right. why not? Yeah, note it. Yeah. So okay, no, no, let's yeah. see how Next it goes. Time. Okay, thanks, Valentina, for such open discussion you, and see you soon on the right uh, round table. Uh, we are moving forward, and uh, I want to invite Roman to the stage. So we will we will cover the uh, data analytics topic. So Roman, how are you? You are the last one in agenda, but hopefully it will be very interesting. So are you are you okay? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. So let's start. Stage is yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Roman. I'm a software engineer at JetBrains in the data analytics team. And today we will talk about how to create a common language between designers and developers for data analytics tasks. Uh, the talk uh, will be divided into theory and practical parts. The theory part is large, but we will create the needed basement for our practice. We will talk about why everyone will certainly need data analytics tasks in even outside of the data analytics team. Uh, how to incorporate data analytics to design system, about the elements, guidelines, and dashboards, of course. Uh, in the practice sec section, we will talk about how to be prepared before the data analytics task uh, development and what flow we should stick to uh, when the data analytics ta task arrives. 
uh, so move forward uh, 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 let's talk about theory uh, what is data analytics uh, data analytics is about extracting useful information draw conclusions and support decision making it's a huge uh, process and uh, there are a bunch of uh, case steps uh, but were interesting only in the last one here uh, data visualization uh, representing data visually through charts graphs or dashboards for easily interpretation by human uh, data analytics uh, does not belong to special teams or products it yet another block for designers and developers to build a project uh, you might encounter such tasks in your daily routine easily. User profiles, overviews, reviews, etc. All these domains can include uh, data analytics elements. One day you definitely will meet uh, data analytics. Uh, but you can develop nothing by yourself and use dashboard platforms where the developer's role is to deliver uh, data rather than code uh, the interface. Uh, while the designer uh, leverages existing service features to construct the dashboard. And even here, uh, you need to follow basic rules of charts and dashboard uh, creation that we will discuss uh, today. Uh, there are great tools uh, here, but our focus is on exploring how to create something similar from scratch. Uh, so, how to create something similar from scratch? Uh, you need to incorporate data analytics into your design system. Uh, design system, once again, briefly, is a complete set of rules and tools to, uh, to make to keep design consistent and unified in different products and projects. Uh, we can incorporate data analytics in design system by the following steps. First of them, uh, understand user needs. For example, make some service, interviews, review existing data. Uh, you need to know your user. Uh, also, we uh, need to identify uh, key data analytics uh, UI components. And mostly today we will talk about uh, this point. Uh, also, you need to ensure that analytics UI components uh, are flexible enough to handle different data sets. Uh, also, define efficient manipulation and exploration patterns for data analytics UI components. Uh, and uh, finally, build data analytics UI components on, on the top of existing design principles and tokens in your company. Uh, and also, uh, don't forget basic design system, essentially, it's responsibility, accessibility, good documentation, and so on. Uh, so let's focus on UI components and guidelines patterns. Uh, I think everybody uh, heard about charts, but what is a chart? Uh, actually, everything is a chart. Uh, charts, graphs, diagrams, plots uh, have differences, but the main point here, uh, um, uh, all of them are charts. And the chart is a, gen a generic term for all of them. Uh, if everything is a chart, what its anatomy? Uh, there are titles, labels, uh, legends, tooltips uh, for different types of charts. Uh, a set of uh, these elements is different, but they are very similar. Uh, for different types of chart, uh, um, uh, for example, for rectangular charts, uh, we can use um, the same title, axis, sticks, and so on. And uh, in circular charts, we see that uh, some of them are the same. Uh, some, some basic rules uh, for different parts of the charts. Uh, the title should reflect the main insight of uh, your idea. Uh, the legend uh, should explain the chart's meaning by defining the association of each visual property, such as color, shape, size, uh, corresponding data. Uh, when possible, um, use labels directly on the chart to avoid long uh, legends. 
uh, by default, uh, tooltips reveal on hover more detailed information or context for specific chart elements. A tooltip should repeat the corresponding values of the data point on both axes and any other relevant uh, details. Uh, and please avoid uh, filling the chart frame with too many elements as it impacts the user ability to interrupt the data. Um, let's talk about uh, purposes. There are a lot of uh, charts classifications uh, and one of them by purpose. Uh, let's take it for our quick overview of uh, for, for charts. We will discuss only one in each category, but in the shared link, uh, you will find all of them. We will share a link to this presentation with you later. Uh, first, uh, comparison. Uh, charts designed for comparison aim to visualize differences between elements. Most of the time, comparison rely on the ability of the human eye to identify longer or bigger shapes with very little or no effort at all. Uh, side by side, uh, positioning and alignment of the visual elements make comparisons even easier. Uh, for example, uh, uh, bar chart, uh, one of the easiest charts to read, which, help, which helps in quick comparison of category data. One axis contains uh, categories and other axis represent values. Uh, it's perfect for comparison between categories and when sorted, finding top X of your data. Uh, the next one category is trend. Uh, trend charts represent uh, data along with the time dimension. Use them mainly to track changes over periods of time or of varying duration and scale. Um, for example, line chart is the most straightforward way to capture how a numeric variable is changing over time. It's perfect for analyzing trends or pro progress over time comparing multiple series. Uh, next category is part of the whole. Uh, the goal of these charts is to show the inner sub subdivision of a value among different categories or groups. Uh, mostly used to represent percents, they can also be used for absolute values. Pie chart here. Uh, one of the most <laughs> uh, common uh, way to show part of the whole data. It's also commonly used with percents, but it's a dangerous chart. You need to consider a lot of warnings to get a good chart. Limit the number of slices uh, to maximum. Display data in percent. Avoid 3D or any other effects. Use con uh, contrasting co co colors. Avoid using multiple pie charts together. Uh, next category is correlation. These charts are better suited to highlight the possible correlation between two or more indicators and how they might, might affect each other. Correlation charts have the final goal of making it easier for the human eye to spot combining behaviors. Scatter plot. Uh, most commonly used chart when observing the relationship between two variables. It's especially useful for, for quickly surfacing potential correlations between data points. Perfect for highlighting the similarities across variables and smaller data sets. Relationship category represents hierarchies. Uh, the intent is to explain the role of an element within an ecosystem or to observe the inner nature of a subject in different phases and states of a process. Uh, for example, uh, Sankey diagrams designed to show two indicators of a data set and how records di distribute among them, highlighting correlations. Perfect for category of categorical relationship, process flow, multiple dimensional analysis. Uh, and finally, category map. Uh, maps are the easiest and the most immediate way to communicate geolocated information. 
crop less map uses differences in shading, color, uh, coloring, or the placing of symbols within predefined areas to indicate the average values of a property or quantity in those areas. Perfect for displaying uh, ge geographical data where each region, state, or country has associated categorical or numerical data. Uh, so, uh, we have discussed new potential elements of your design system uh, and now ready to look to some guidelines. There are a lot of them. You can see names and links uh, here to, uh, and it's just a smallest part of them. Uh, let's, let's take a brief look to one of them. It's named core principle of data visualization. For example, it says you must not hide any data, should reduce cl clutter, uh, the charge should be self-sufficient, uh, and please use pre-attentive processing, avoid 3D, and always um, start from zero. Uh, dashboards. Uh, someday you will want to combine your charts in dashboards and uh, dashboards offer a curated lens through which people view large and complex data sets at a glance. Uh, they provide layers of abstractions and simplification for numerous related data points so that uh, dashboard viewers get an overview of the most important or relevant information in time efficient way. Uh, let's look to one of the guidelines for them. It shows different tactics to represent your da data in different structures, visualization uh, layouts, and uh, how different interactions can be. Uh, so, uh, theory part is over. Uh, we have discussed why data analytics can touch everyone, how to incorporate data analytics into the design system, design system elements, uh, charts, uh, and guidelines and patterns. Uh, if you want more information, uh, these books are great uh, for, for continuous uh, investigation in this team. Uh, so, practice. Uh, on practice, first of all, you should uh, uh, beforehand incorporate data analytics elements and guidelines into the design system. Uh, document chart vocabulary, core traits, guidelines, patterns. Create UI components from scratch or on top of an existing library and uh, develop an interactive uh, showcase of your UI components. For example, it could be a storybook. Then you wait some time for the task and put it in practice. Uh, finally, we are ready to very short discussion about development. Why, uh, why short? Uh, because there are a lot of libraries on different levels for such uh, tasks. Uh, I can highlight some of them. Uh, for example, D3 as a standard de facto, uh, interesting library with X, and more high level E charts, Nivo JS, Chart JS, High Charts, Plotly. But everyone developer makes uh, their decision based on the requirements and user needs. Uh, the, uh, there are some incorporation of uh, components to design system in open source. I want to mention one of them. It's a uh, carbon design system of IBM. They have made great work to have great data visualization components and guidelines for themselves and uh, for community. Um, so uh, at this moment, we should have the next uh, tools in our tool chain. Uh, knowledge from the theory that we discussed, uh, documentation of our elements and patterns, ready to use design system, uh, components in code uh, that we implemented. Uh, and uh, the flow for the data analytics task will be the following. We got the task. We try to understand our audience, our users. 
we discover our data, how we can use it, uh, choose chart type from what we have and what our guidelines uh, say us. Uh, uh, also, we use these components or, uh, or component or components uh, and finally release our uh, project for, for this task. Uh, in practice, part of the, this talk, we talked about steps to do in practice, a little bit about development part of the process, uh, new tool chain to carry out data analytics task to release, and task to release flow. Uh, and uh, my takeaways, uh, uh, please remember that charts is one more way to communicate with users. Designers and developers can learn, work out and cement uh, the rules. Rules is not set in stall in the same time, yes. Uh, and uh, art um, is still here. Art, it's great uh, uh, and uh, some kind of pro word of, uh, in data visualization world, uh, world uh, a picture is just a thousand words thank you that's it from my side thank you for your attention thank you roman it was a very comprehensive view from the data analytics point of view and there is a fun uh, comment in 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 the chat are you considering to launching a podcast uh, of uh, about the data analytics so you <laughs> made a quite good intro i think uh, uh, yeah actually I, i've made uh, some pod, pod, pod podcast not, not now but uh, uh, i have such experience in my life so maybe sometime about uh, data visualization very nice so and yeah as uh, roman said we will share some extra materials right after the stream uh, roman prepared much more detailed overview so we will publish these materials later uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, you said that there are many libraries uh, and design systems uh, that have a standard components plus some data visualization components. What is your favorite one and maybe the biggest one that you ever seen? Um, thank you for your question. Uh, the favorite one, I think it's eCharts for now because it's one of the biggest one and it has uh, very good uh, documentation, uh, a lot of stars on GitHub, you know, uh, and um, I think it's very good um, starting point for your um, data, data visualization flow in your company uh, but after that I, I think that you will make everything from scratch with d3 but uh, a good st starting point is eCharts library so uh, how customizable they are so for example if i've got my own design system how i can customize the existing libraries to my company's needs uh, including the custom branding, colors, maybe typography. So have you tried to configure them? Yes, yes. Uh, um, as uh, um, many libraries, uh, uh, they have uh, teaming. Uh, you can uh, send uh, your theme uh, to this library with your colors tokens and so on and uh, everything will be fine uh, but of course if we are talking uh, about um, high level libraries uh, they are not so uh, customizable maybe as you want but uh, as uh, lower you will dive into these libraries uh, uh, you will have more possibilities to uh, uh, customize uh, this um, visualization but you will uh, spend much more time with uh, them and uh, with uh, development uh, your own components agree with you and yeah if you need to start fast and if you need a quick solution it works yeah you you can apply theming and it just works 
Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Roman for for your presentation. Uh, let's bring Kate back. So she should be close to you, right? Because yeah. right right now, we we finished with our lineup and uh, overall agenda. So now we've got a round table with all our speakers. Uh, guys, welcome back. Uh, let's have an open discussion. I like one question that was asked at the beginning of the stream. Uh, Mark asked, how do you integrate quality assurance to the process? And I think it's a very valid question because uh, we spoke a lot about design development, uh, but how do we test things uh, in the middle? Because quality is a very important part. So Nikita, you mentioned the testing process in your uh, presentation. So how do you feel, how do you think we can integrate quality assurance into the design to development process? So uh, I think there are two parts. Uh, first is like user testing if the UI is like if the usability is uh, good, if the, it solves the user's problem, and it goes, as I said uh, before the handoff, of course. Because mm -hmm. before the preparation of the ready for development uh, mockups, and it can be even with some draft UI, some like uh, very raw materials. Because but, so it depends on what you want to test and what you want to prove. Uh, but if we are talking about like the um, things like accessibility or availability on different platforms. I think there are different layers of quality assurance. First one is, of course, the design system. For example, all this uh, accessibility stuff regarding colors, uh, keyboards, input, and so on, should be considered on the design system level, uh, yeah, starting with the colors, of course. Uh, then it also uh, should be like the template of the handoff page is also uh, like a list of uh, what should be done uh, before going to the development. So again, all errors, all uh, like uh, corner cases, empty states, and so on, it can be a part of the template. And so it's another level of the quality assurance. And of course, the proper review process from other designers, as you can maybe remember uh, in this file template, there is a design review section where you put your designs and share it with designers, developers, and ask for the feedback. Uh, you can also share it with your QA engineers if you have one, and if they want to check if, you, it's, if it's a part of your process. And of course, maybe the last uh, layer of the quality assurance is the experience of the designer, is the, um, like the uh, knowledge of the designer. So if you are an experienced designer, you can maybe skip some uh, some steps because we already know that it works and it doesn't work. But we don't recommend to skip any testing. So it's better to test something 100 times to avoid any issues. Uh, Ekaterina, what is your perspective from the design point of view? Do you want to add something? So Nikita mentioned design review with uh, other design colleagues. Do you have such process in your team? Yes, uh, we have. And uh, you mean design review for the contribution to the library or just design review in the product? Yeah, I um, think uh, let's start with uh, any of them. So, for example, design library. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, to contribute something to the design library, of course, we uh, do design review and discuss uh, proposed components and discuss how it would be suitable for every product which is using our design system. Of course, yes. But uh, talking about the product, it depends on uh, how many designers work in the product at the time. At the same time, for example, sometime I worked uh, as a one designer and there was no design review, but it was a design demo where I presented designs to the front end team, to the product uh, manager and other guys. And we, discuss, we were discussing uh, how it might be implemented and uh, what uh, possible pitfalls might be there. But and then now uh, we uh, there are two designers in our team. I work with them, mm -hmm. uh, my colleague, and we um, 
discuss it in our small group product team of the Kadana product, uh, like, uh, us, two designers and uh, product manager, we discuss our solutions and uh, brainstorm often, pretty often we brainstorm make maps and uh, uh, analyze our proposals in terms of how it would be suitable and how it might solve the problem uh, which we want to solve. Yes, but uh, there is no such review like I designed some component, please review if I wrong or right, or like, no, not, not this way. Pretty different approach if we are compared with the library contribution. Okay, that's that sounds very reasonable. And Valentina, in, from the, I don't know, desktop team lead perspective point of view, do you participate in some design testing and how do you implement the quality assurance in the in the design to development process? So, do you have any uh, process? Uh, actually, we just uh, as we recently started to work with the dedicated designer, we are right in the progress of of establishing such a process. And this lection that I mentioned, like this talk mm -hmm. that our designer gave, uh, was also aimed to our core team to actually show them what is expected result and that on the uh, core step, uh, QA step, it's also um, a good time to actually check how much design really resembles what was on uh, mockups. And another thing that we are thinking of making is um, to uh, invite our uh, QA engineers to our uh, handoff sessions or maybe like um, brainstorming sessions because usually they are the people who know product the best uh, and they also can uh, present user point of view better than uh, de than us developers and so yeah this is our plan of maybe not exactly like uh, testing and verifying things but more of uh, collaborating together in like finding Mm, the better solutions uh, sounds sounds like a good process that everybody should follow right so it's just a it's a common sense and andre do you do you have something in the web team similar to what we are discussing now or maybe you think that you guys need to start this process as well well actually in my current team uh we don't yet uh, implemented uh, tests uh, for our design system. Well, we're st still uh, building, uh, you know, just the code tests. But uh, uh, from my previous team, uh, from a huge company where were a lot of products, uh, the whole testing was uh, covered with behind behind uh, some CI tasks and. Uh, that that was our b biggest uh, secret that uh, every commit started uh, the whole bunch of processes and uh, that was the main uh, gatekeeper actually yeah that's a, that's a good point by the way that you should uh, integrate the testing into the regular delivery process sounds so, sounds like a good idea roman do you want to add something from your end what's your opinion um uh yes i, I think uh, ci cd uh, features for this process uh, are great and should be implemented we also uh, used uh, such processes um, in our workflow yeah i think th th that's it yeah, just to summarize the and all answers that we received so there are many uh, steps where we can implement the testing processes, starting from the general hypothesis where we've got idea, we want to test this idea, finishing with the final solution, testing it before deploying onto production. So yeah, that's a quality, it's a big story, it should be integrated onto the whole end-to-end -end scenario. Okay, so guys, uh, regarding design systems, so we had four different slides about that and everybody made their own explanation what is design system uh let's brainstorm all together what it is so 
who wants to start with uh, with uh, the, your opinion? And after that, we will add more and more uh, blocks into the what is design system. I can start maybe from the design perspective. Uh, so I would say it's the um, it's the basis of the it's like the knowledge which we store for everybody which we agreed of, and the reusable blocks of UI and UX elements. It's important. That it's not like, not only about UI but also about UX. Mm -hmm. So you agreed uh, not only on visual part of the components but also on the behavior part, right? On uh, different combination patterns and so on. So it's like the um, yeah, UI, UX blocks, which you can reuse uh, from the design and development perspective. It's also important, these bindings between design and development, because if you have something in design, it means it's only, I don't know, uh, UI kit or just images. It's not the proper design system. And if you have something only on the development side, it's also like uh, not the same as design system because for example for testing usually designers use designs and if you test something with not real actual components it means that you uh, what you're going to implement is not exactly what you tested right and it's, it's not right so yeah again it's blocks ui ux blocks which you can reuse and they are similar in design and development something like this and also <laughs> maybe last part is the process which can uh, mm -hmm. sync uh, both sides. So for example, uh, we created this thing called design system and it's like the same in code and design, but it uh, like growing, growing creature. And if you add any changes, you should follow some process and this process should be established and it's also designed part of the design system. Yeah, I agree with your design system is a very complex monster and uh, there are so many blocks. I mentioned the same uh, the same parts, UX, atomic UI components and some principles and process, how you maintain changes and implement some new components. That's also very important. Guys, what else we want to add uh, on the table in terms of design system? What is missing? Yeah. Yeah, I can continue. And I agree with Nikita that the uh, design system is not only a set of components, but is also a set of rules. Like it's not only UI, it's also UX. And you have to uh, care uh, about like how this component should behave and how user will um, uh, like, work with the com with component and want uh, emotions or problems he might experience during this process. And also I like the metaphor of building process i mean building uh, architecture or like you have bricks you have materials and you have yeah. a list of rules how to build how to place these bricks properly what space should be between them and how to build a house uh, which would be pretty stable and beautiful and comfortable and uh, user friendly so it's really a combination of rules uh, of uh, high quality materials and um, uh, a lot of thoughts about home who will live in this house, like mm -hmm. how comfortable it would be for them. So I, 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 I like to like, uh, apply this metaphor uh, to the design process. It's pretty simple. Yeah. If you are building house from wrong blocks, what you will get at the end, that's, uh, that's obvious. Uh, what what else, guys? Uh, so, uh, anything else? What we are missing? Mm, I I can add about uh, development part of this process. We also need sure. uh, blocks that was developed in a, a web, for example, uh, and uh, uh, here uh, we also need uh, to have some kind of basement of rules uh, and uh, uh, it would be great to have as much more communication as we can uh, with uh, designers with documentation and for example right now we can use some kind of api from figma and uh, this process um, 
uh, can be automated. Uh, we can take uh, tokens and uh, some code from Figma. And uh, I think that uh, right now we can have not two design system, one in Figma, for example, and one implemented in code, but we can uh, have uh, one big design system with uh, documentation, uh, design in Figma, and uh, components in code um, is something uh, big. And uh, if we change uh, some part, um, uh, for example, in Figma, it will uh, change everything in components. And it's great because uh, uh, on, only now we will have such possibility only with these tools. For example, with, uh, I don't know, Photoshop, we did not have such, uh, uh, such possibilities. Yeah, tools are, I, I, actually, that's a good point that now tools enable us with the right processes. And uh, it's a good point that you mentioned that it's not just UX principles, it's some automated patterns, for example, color pairing or uh, code style, even what you mentioned. So it could be also part of the design system. That's, that's, a, that's a great uh, catch. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. Uh, anything else what we want to add? Any new ideas? Yes. Actually, I would like to uh, add a sh short uh, point to the things that were uh, said before that uh, design system shouldn't be just a bunch of UX, UI components, uh, rules, restrictions, documentation, whatever, but it should be a clear uh, list of UX, UI components because it's really, uh, it could be really useful for scalability and onboarding mm -hmm. new team members, because I can tell from a perspective uh, of a developer uh, whose team grew up into times for uh, several months. And it was really helpful just to well, show uh, some uh, Figma mockups and uh, some uh, libraries on GitHub. And uh, that really helped uh, newcoming developers to understand, understand what's going on uh, here, what is possible, what is not, and how, well, how to do their job. Uh, that's it. 100% agree with you. We should use design system as onboarding documents to uh, onboard new team members and show them that's a language that we speak here. So that's, that's our common rules. Valentina, want to add something from your end? Uh, I rather want to say that I'm very agree with the part that it can be used as onboarding, especially not only for designers, but also for developers saying like, okay, you need to implement something and most likely you don't have to create your own components. Uh, and for desktop developers, it's a little bit more tricky because you need to somewhere have this mapping between Figma uh, components and the one that you can find in um, uh, our uh, code base. But still, it's something that would be very useful and would save a lot of time uh, thinking or trying to find where this component exactly can be found. So, yeah. So, it's a good uh principle, we should say that design systems should be self-explaining. So when people see it, they should uh, understand how it works. If something should be explained, then that design system doesn't work. So yeah, that's why it's kind of onboarding document. Okay, so there is one more question that I want to discuss in this quorum. And we, we touched this previously, uh, how from your perspective, in your opinion, how deeply designer should be onboarded into development and uh, how deeply they should understand the coding languages. We touched the education bit here and uh, in Nikita, for example, said that uh, some web development knowledge is required. So Nikita, what's your, what's, what's your thoughts about how deeply we should uh, learn coding languages if you are a product designer? 
Yeah. So I think, of course, it depends on the platform. Um, yeah, I'm a web designer, so I'm working on web applications. And I would say for this case, the basic knowledge of CSS and HTML is more than enough to work with developers and like speak with them on the same language. Just because when you review the work of the developer, like the final result, result in the web browser, you usually use the inspection tool. And this inspection tool contains only like CSS and HTML, right? Mm -hmm. You don't need to know all this post process, post CSS procession and so on all these frameworks and stuff because it is not uh, what you see in the final result, right? So I guess like the styling part of the uh, CSS, the positioning and is most important part. Maybe HTML is not so important, but on the other hand, it's also easier than CSS, I guess. So yeah, um, I think from my perspective, it's enough. And you always can say for developer that try to use like this property, try to use this property instead of property used. Uh, yeah, so you can speak again on the same language and understand each other. Okay, so as far as I understood from your perspective, the basic skill of markdown and styling is enough for web. Uh, uh, Yekaterina, what do you think from your point of view? Any more understanding or is it enough? Yeah, I agree uh, with Nikita's thoughts because uh, in my experience, I really often use uh, inspect tool and it really mm -hmm. helps to me because uh, I can easily change the styles and sometimes HTML uh, layout like lay, uh, right in the browser and just make a screenshot and tell the developer, please do that. Like uh, margin is uh, 16 pixels, uh, padding is uh, blah, 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 and so on. It's really easier than I will screenshot the um, uh, de developed layout, uh, paste it to Figma, try to design it in Figma and explain in Figma. No, it's really easier to in, in browser and saves a lot of time. And yes, that's nice that we speak in, and the same language as developers, and uh, it's pretty understandable. Yes, and I, if I wouldn't know this, not like CSS and HTML, it would be really hard for me to communicate. But sometimes it's also nice to understand, not to know, but understand um, some terminology from backend side, for example, mm -hmm. when guys try to explain you why uh, for example, why some processes are too low, and they explained with um, a bunch of requests from the big backend to the front end, and then that's nice when you understand the meaning of these words, <laughs> and you can uh, clearly understand the reason why they implemented such kind of behavior for the component, or we have some limitations. Maybe we have really large amount of data, and we uh, need the pagination. Uh, instead of lazy loading of the table. And uh, when developers explain you or, or what uh, limitation they faced, that's nice when you understand the meaning of this explanation. Yeah, but that's a good point. Yeah. yeah but um, I think it's not necessary to learn the backend stuff, it's just um, uh, important to communicate more and ask uh, developers to explain and uh, just really uh, put a bit of forward, a bit more effort to uh, got it, to understand it, and to remember it. I 100% agree with you. If, uh, let's say, designer or product manager know some basics, they can select some solutions that require less resources, so the solution will be shipped much quicker. In this perspective, it's not just implementing changes in the markdown and styles and sending code snippet to front-end developer asking him to implement this margin and padding. It's about the solution that you selected, the high-level UX uh, solution. So it could be even the navigation pattern or pagination versus uh, loading uh, what, what you mentioned. That, that makes sense. 
uh, Andre, Valentina, Roman, what do you think from the software development point of view? So how deeply designers should be onboarded into the coding? So what's your view? Uh, maybe I start uh, by okay. adding uh, the the uh, point that sometimes it could be really uh, useful if uh, a designer knows not only about CSS and HTML, which is well obviously uh, the most useful uh, skill, but also knows about uh, the tools uh, and uh, how you can build your front end. Because, for example, in our project, it's not always. Uh, possible to make a dedicated uh, staging server to present some feature. And sometimes uh, we're asking our designers to run it locally and uh, to check uh, whether it matches their expectations or not. So it's not a must have, but sometimes it can be really useful. Yeah, and this speeds up the testing process. So if you can run something locally and see how it looks like. So yeah, definitely it's a good point. What else? Yeah. And from my side, I can also say that uh, testing for us, it's definitely something that not happens in the release. And we actually have a plugin, which is actually a zip archive. And so it means that uh, designer, it's better when designer knows where on the build server they can find the, uh, this, the latest version of the plugin to um, check everything because of course we can share this with the designer but sometimes it's just faster i don't know they have their free time at 7 a.m and everybody's sleeping so it's better if they know where to find the latest uh the latest build and also i think um what you mentioned that i i don't know exactly what skills i needed for this but to um uh, actually understand how uh, time consuming some solution can be and uh, to find a balance between uh, creating some beautiful and uh, usable design and something that is also implementable in the time frame that uh, we have for this uh, feature on functionality. So I think I didn't answer uh, the question, but yeah, some of the expectation for designers from developers side. You, you. I think you touched very, very complex uh, topic. How we make trade-offs, uh, time versus I don't know user experience, even when we select the solution. So, uh, what kind of experience and skill should be developed? So, I think that's a that's a very philosophical question. But uh, as much as you know. And as much as you experience you've got, the better trade-offs you will you will get. So uh, that's that makes sense. Uh, Roman, what's what's your point? Do you want to add something? Maybe some visualization skills or what? What do you think? Mm -hmm. uh, definitely yes, but I wanted to add. Uh, not only about uh, development, but maybe uh, the main sphere. I, I think mm -hmm. that a designer uh, need to know uh, the domain. Uh, for example, if you work in automotive, uh, you should definitely know something about cars, uh, engines, and so on. Um, even if you work in a web project. Uh, uh, so I, I think it's a cru crucial skill, um, not only tools, uh, programming language, it's like a tool, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. but ab about uh, domain as a whole sphere uh, of your company. Yeah, I agree with you. So I think the main message should be never stop learning. So even if you're learning uh, code languages or the, the domain uh, that you, I don't know, trying to tackle with your product, uh, never stop learning. So there is uh, there is a main message from from our stream today. So I would say that's basically it for today, guys. We've made the quite uh, good talk uh, and the comprehensive overview on this topic. Very hot topic, very debatable. That's why we had the roundtable at the end. 
So I want to say thank you to everybody who was active in the chat. So we tried to pick some questions and answer them. Hopefully you enjoyed that. So uh, let's stay on touch and uh, hopefully we will see you again. And uh, guys, thanks everybody uh, who've been a speaker today. It was a very good uh, stream. I enjoyed it personally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.